Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Tools and Strategies for Implementing IPSC-Based Cell Models for Neurodegenerative Disease Drug Discovery. I'm Kaylee Bach of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Bioneer AS. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit Bioneer.dk. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Benjamin Schmidt, Senior Scientist at Bioneer AS, and Peter Reinhardt, Principal Research Scientist, Team Lead Cell Programming and Transduction, Medicinal Chemistry and Screening Biology, Neuroscience Discovery, AbbVie. Benjamin, Peter, you may now begin your presentation. Hello all together. It's my pleasure to talk today together with my former PhD fellow, Peter Reinhardt. We have been doing our PhD together in Germany like 10 years ago. And it's my pleasure to talk to him today together with him. And we are going to talk about tools and strategies for implementing IPS cell-based cell models for new degenerative disease drug discovery. So before I jump into my presentation, I would quickly like to introduce Bioneer. We are a Danish specialty CRO, which is operating worldwide. So we are taking um, service contract service and um, I'm representing today the CNS uh, department of our of Bioneer. And um, we are using IPS cell technology combined with CRISPR gene editing technology and differentiation to a new degenerative to neurons to, uh, to model new degenerative diseases. So a quick introduction to IPS cell technology that was first described in um, 15 years ago in 2007 for humans and 2006 for mice. And it was Shinya Yamanaka and his labs who described it first how to reprogram already somatic cells, in this case they used skin cells, to a pluripotent state and they found out that you have to overexpress four factors which are CMYK, OCT4, SOX2 and KLF4 and then you can reprogram an already differentiated somatic cell to a pluripotent stem cell. So, a skin biopsy can be taken from a patient or from a healthy control and the fibroblasts can be cultivated in, uh, in cell culture and then the four factors have to be overexpressed. At, to date it's normally done by uh, non-integrating non viruses and then you obtain these uh, pluripotent, induced pluripotent stem cells which are immortal, which are self-renewal and you can differentiate them to all the cell, cell types blood cells, uh, kidney cells, uh, liver cells, and of course also neurons. And um, then you can use these neurons either for disease modeling and drug discovery. And the hope of course is also to use these uh, differentiated cells for cell replacement therapies. In order to exploit the full potential of IPS cell technology, it's very often combined with uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology, what we are using as a service, offering as a service. So for the generation of uh, knockout lines or for the generation of isogenic gene-corrected controls or insertion of mutations or reporter lines, that's what we are offering as a service. And I would like to quickly go through the workflow that we are using we bring in the CRISPR-Cas9 complex into our living cells, into the iPS cells with, uh, with a nuclear factor from Amaxa. And then normally, typically a few days after um, nuclear faction, we are sorting the cells with a single cell sorter. And here in-house, we are using the F site from Cytina. And we are sorting the cells out into a 96 well plate. So to make sure that we are looking at monoclonal populations when we are screening our cells. 
So, and then a few weeks later, um, we are screening those cells. So when they are um, when they have grown dense enough, they are split into a replica plate that we are keeping in cell culture and into a DNA plate. And this DNA plate is then screened by, for example, just by PCR, if it's possible, or with a restriction enzyme assay. And uh, based on this screening, we are selecting then positive clones, candidate clones, which are then confirmed by sequencing. We trace these clones back in the cell culture, find them there and split them, we bank them, and then finally we are performing quality controls. And I will later on in this presentation uh, uh, elaborate a little bit more what these quality controls are. Now, I would quickly like to give you an overview to the different approaches for gene editing. I would say 50% of our work is the generation of knockout lines. That's for some reason the most appealing uh, gene editing approach that uh, most of our customers actually want to have. So knocking out a certain gene to study its function. Then um, also a very often, quite often approach is single base modifications, which I would say maybe 20% where we are inserting mutations into a healthy donor line, into an IPS line that is actually from a um, healthy individual. But we uh, can, of course, also, if available, if we have IPS cells with a certain mutation, we can correct this mutation. Then it has also become more and more popular, uh, this is now the third point, the insertion of inducible genes into safe site loci. We have mainly used the AVS1 locus, in our lab here, but we have also worked on different low sign in the meanwhile. And um, what we also have done is insertion of a reported gene where you can, um, that allows for tracking the expression of a certain gene during differentiation. For example, if you couple a gene with a GFP or to localize the gene in the cells. So I would li quickly like to uh, talk about the technique that we are using for these different approaches. Uh, knockout is normally generated with the combination of two CRISPRs which are cutting close to each other. So you can see here um, a, a draft of a gene and two CRISPRs which are located. One CRISPR is located in the exon and the other CRISPR is located in the downstream intron. So we are removing the so-called splice donor site from this exon. And we typically use the exon, which is the first exon, which is present in all known isoforms of the gene. And then for screening, we have two sets of primers. And the first set is surrounding the deletion, which is called in, uh, which we are calling the detection assay, uh, PCR set. And for the absence, for the other set, one of the, which is called, or which we call the absence assay PCR test, one of the primers is located within the region that was deleted. So for screening these clones, we just carry out a simple PCR and with the detection assay, which is shown here at the left side, um, you expect for wild type clones a certain size of the PCR product and for knockout clones, you expect a shorter PCR product uh, because you have cut out um, a part of the piece of the gene. And in the absence assay, for wild type clones, you also expect a certain size of the PCR product, and you expect that for knockout clones, uh, that, the PCR that no PCR product is present. So just as an example how that looks like practically, practically in the lab, we are normally screening 96 clones in the 96 well plate, and you can see um, here different clones, and Clone number one, uh, you can see, is has the wild type sequence with the size of the wild type product. And accordingly to this, at the right side, you see the absence assay, you have a PCR product because the wild type sequence is still present. If you look at the second band, clone number two, we have a shorter PCR product, which corresponds to the size of the knockout. And corresponding to that, we don't have a PCR product in the absence assay at the right side. And then the third example is shown in clone number three, where we have both products. And that was obviously a clone where only one um, allele was uh, uh, destroyed and the other allele was still wild type. And of course, you would expect a product in the absence assay because one allele is still present. 
So if we, if we now look at clone number two, this uh, fulfilled the criteria of the detection and the absence assay. We have a template of the sequence and in blue capital letters, you can see the exonic region and in black small letters, you can see the intronic region. And we have cut out the yellow part here. And when we now sequence our clone, then we can indeed confirm that this part was cut out. This is a very easy way, very easy and efficient way to screen for knockout clones and to generate knockout clones. And by cutting out a part of the exon and fusing this part to the subsequent intron, you are normally generating a cryptic sequence that the cells can't interpret and then uh, the product undergoes um, um, nonsense mediated decay. Or sometimes you are also generating a stop codon later on, which then leads to the gradation. And I would like to give an example uh, for the strategy to correct a mutation or to insert a mutation. Here we are normally using one CRISPR in combination with one homologous template. And as a homologous template, it's most convenient to just use a single stranded oligodeoxynucleotide, an SSODN, which is a um, short primer, if you want, of 100 base pairs. And uh, this is homologous to your gene of interest, but it contains, of course, a mutation. So one base is different. And for the screening, we have only one primer pair and a sequencing primer pair. And we design these um, uh, SSODNs in a way that we are creating a cutting site for restriction enzyme, enzyme. And then the PCR product, if we have a successfully genetic, uh, genetically modified clone, that the PCR product is cut by a certain um, enzyme. This looks then as follows. At the very left side, you can see uh, a wild type clone, which has a certain PCR product. And uh, even if this is treated with the enzyme, uh, it's not uh, cut because it was not modified. For heterozygous clones, you would expect that one allele is indeed recognized by the enzyme and then cut. So you get this pattern, which is shown in the middle. And for homozygous clones, we have both alleles which are cut. And this is just an example. So uh, normally the efficiency of these single base modifications is much lower. So we have to screen uh, many more clones for such an approach. But here you can see marked by the arrows, you have uh, heterozygous clones and homozygous clones. So you have candidate clones and those clones have then to be confirmed by sequencing. And that's what we are using in-house Sango sequencing. And you can see here a sequence for the wild type, uh, for the wild type gene, for a heterozygous gene and for a homozygous gene. Um, I would like to quickly mention using this technique, we have generated a set of isogenic lines comprising four different lines for EBIS, which is the European Bank and Use Group and Stem Cells. And all the lines which are deposited at EBIS are available for everyone. And we have generated three sets of isogenic lines with different APOE genotypes. I'm only mentioning that because they have become very popular in the past. So, um, and since we are talking about CNS, I would like to just mention we have generated three sets and they are consisting of different APOE genotypes. APOE is the most important risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And uh, we have generated the main genotypes APOE22, which is protective for Alzheimer, APOE33, which is neutral and APOE44, which is associated with a higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. And we also included a line which has an APOE knockout. So all these lines are isogenic. And from uh, this set, for this set, we have, gen we have generated this set in three different IPS cell lines. And all of them are deposited at EBISC and publicly available. Now, the strategy for insertion of inducible genes in a safe site loci. Here we normally have the strategy that we insert uh, two different expression cassettes on the both alleles in, um, for example, the AABS1, the adeno associated virus 1 locus. And on one allele, we insert a so-called tetracycline transactivator, which is uh, constitutively expressed 
However, nothing happens unless you are adding DOCS. And when you're adding DOCS, it will bind to the tetracycline transactivator. This will then bind to the other allele where we have a tetracycline responsive element. And this drives then a certain gene of interest, GOI. And this is interchangeable, of course. There will be some examples later in this presentation. And then the gene of interest is expressed. So you have a line uh, that expresses your gene of interest uh, after uh, DOCS addition. So comparing this uh, safe side, low side gene editing with uh, conventional methods, for example, virus, virus methods, where you have uh, inserted the gene of interest with a virus, uh, using the CRISPR gene editing, we have a defined integration at a certain site, versus for viruses, we normally have random integration, and there you always have, of course, the risk that you destroy a gene by a random integration if the virus jumps into a, a certain loci of a gene. We have uh, only one integration using the CRISPR gene editing approach, while uh, versus multiple integrations, and that can also lead to a lot of variabilities for the expression. Um, and that, of course, leads to, um, even if you are comparing different lines, you have a very comparable expression level uh, when you have the safe side, low side gene editing, compared to viruses where you can have, uh, where the expression level can differ a lot. And then, of course, for the CRISPR gene editing approach, you don't have to work in a safety class two lab. Um, it's a normal cell culture lab, whereas uh, with viruses, you have to work in safety class two lab. So after we have found positive clones, uh, we normally bank them uh, in freezing wilds and store them in a nitrogen tank. And then we, using, we are using one wild for quality controls. And what we are offering as your quality controls is, of course, that the cells are still viable after we have banked them. So we thaw one while, and one day later, we are taking a picture showing that the cells are still viable. We normally carry out a mycoplasma test by PCR. For the clones that we are generating, we do an identity test uh, by STR analysis, showing that the clone that we had genetically modified is the same as the parental line. We do genotyping by sequencing to confirm that the banked clones have indeed the genetic modification that's done by Sanger sequencing. Then we do different low potency tests, either by expression of stem cell markers or by true lineage differentiation. Um, this is carried out either by staining or by uh, flow cytometry, but also by QRT PCR experiments. Sometimes we are also take, checking for CRISPR off-target effects. This is, however, very rare, and not a lot of customers have requested this so far. And then we are also carrying, uh, carrying out karyotype analyses. This is not what we are doing in-house. This is G-bending karyotyping, and we also do a SNP analyses, which is done on a DNA chip, which tells you which is kind of a high molecular uh, G-bending karyotype, if you want. So for disease modeling, we exclusively work only with gene edited lines, with isogenic lines. So we start normally with an iPS line, which has a mutation, which we are uh, correcting using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And since we are working mainly on um, new degenerative diseases, we differentiate them to neurons. And then we compare these neurons. And since we have isogenic lines, we can detect very subtle changes in these neurons. Why we are using isogenic lines? Uh, this is, goes back to a study that uh, we have done together, Peter and me, in 2013, where we have compared different isogenic lines with uh, age and gender match controls. And this is um, gene expression profiling, so it's a cluster dendrogram. And what we found is that uh, the patient lines clustered most closely related to their uh, isogenic gene corrected counterparts. So IGC stands for isogenic gene corrected. So by the height in the cluster dendrogram, you can see how closely they are, how, how closely they are clustering together. And um, you can see that the isogenic lines for both of the patients and the different clones that we were using uh, are very similar, uh, even after differentiation. So this was actually taken after 30 days of differentiation. 
And when you look at control one, you can see that control one was actually um, uh, paired regarding channel and age for patient one. It was clustering more closely with patient two and control two, which was matched regarding channel and age to patient two was quite different from all the other lines. So this was only meant to show you the power of gene editing uh, and the benefits of gene editing that you have that you don't have to deal with uh, individual variabilities from a different genomic background. So, and now I would like to give you a short uh, case study where, which we have done uh, together with Yu Zhang and Christine Freude from the University of Copenhagen a few years ago. This involved iPS cell lines from patients with a mutation in the chimp 2 p gene. Chimp 2 b um, uh, is involved in endosome trafficking and mutations in this gene lead to frontotemporal dementia, FTD, which is associated with degeneration of the cortex. And we had three patient lines and for all the three patients, we generated an isogenic gene corrected control. And we also included independent uh, controls, IPS cells from independent controls, which were uh, matched regarding general age. We differentiated these IPS cells using a protocol which was published in 2009, Chambers. Uh, this involves the usage of two inhibitors, which are inhibiting the SMAT signaling pathway. And by that, uh, after 15 days, you end up with neural progenitor cells, which are self-renewal and which can be kept in culture. They can be frozen down. And from this stage, you can carry on and uh, mature those neural progenitors in our case to cortical neurons uh, but they can also be differentiated to other kind of neurons motor neurons or dopaminergic neurons has been shown um, depending on the patterning factors that you're going to use in your uh, maturation medium and then after six to 12 weeks um, you're typically carrying out the analyses so we first characterized our neurons and at the right side, you can see a draft of the layers, the different layers of the cortex. And there are different markers, for example, TBR1, CTIP2, ZP2, and BRAIN2. And we investigated these markers by uh, immunocytoflame uh, fluorescence. Um, and we found that all these markers were expressed. So then, since um, chimp to be is involved in endosome trafficking we had a look at the endosomes using electron microscopy and there are three different types the lucent endosomes which are shown on top which are large endosomes that do not have any inclusions then we have endosomes with a moderate uh, amount of inclusions and we have the very dense inclusions uh, shown on the bottom so we quantified these um, endosomes and we found that the area of the endosomes was larger and that the amount of the uh, lucent endosomes was higher in the uh, mutant lines compared to the isogenic gene corrected controls and the independent control. In this study we also looked at the mitochondria and um, in this case we looked at the inner life of the mitochondria at the cristae and we found a significantly higher number of mitochondria in the patient lines uh, which were missing these cristae, and that was quantified and also compared to the isogenic controls, showing a significantly higher amount of uh, these mitochondria lacking the, these cristae. So this was just meant as a simple example how we have been doing disease modeling for new, de new degenerative disease. Um, and how a single base modification actually can lead to a phenotypic change in your iPS cell derived neurons. Another very uh, interesting tool for disease modeling is the induction of NGN2, doxycycline inducible NGN2, which we typically insert into the AVS1 locus, safe site locus. Uh, we have deposited several lines at EBISC, which have such an inducible NGN2 gene in the AVS1 locus. And um, these lines have become more and more popular because it makes it very easy to differentiate them in a very short time to functional uh, neurons. So to come from these IPS lines within only six days to a very neuronal looking like uh, network. 
we also characterize these neurons. I think Peter has some much nicer pictures later in his presentation, so I'm not showing this too long. But um, uh, crucial markers for cortical neurons are expressed as well as glutamatergic and GABAergic markers. So um, a recent publication actually uh, used these NGN2 uh, overexpressing lines as a co-culture system with astrocytes. And um, that was carried out in collaboration with Janssen, uh, Alfredo Cabrera from Janssen. And he showed that um, these NGN2 derived neurons are actually superior towards uh, dual SMET differentiated neurons when co-cultured with astrocytes and that their activity is very similar to that of primary mouse neurons. So, for example, the resting membrane potential of the NGN2 derived neurons was at minus 60 millivolt, whereas all the analyzed neurons uh, which were differentiated with the dual SMET differentiation protocol, which are shown here in blue at the left side, had only a resting membrane potential of around minus 40. And upon uh, depolarization, the NGN2, a lot, many more. NGN2 derived neurons were um, actually um, generating action potentials. So, and they, those were found to be active similar to that of uh, primary mouse neural cultures. Um, we have deposited several lines at EBIS, a wild type line, Bounty OTN C13, but we also have deposited lines, uh, NGN2 lines, in combination with uh, mutations in the MAPT gene. Now, the last example that I would like to give is also an inducible gene, alpha cyanoclein, SNCA. This is a very important risk gene for Parkinson's disease. And um, in Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's disease on a molecular level can be characterized by the formation of so-called Lewy bodies. And these inclusions are formed by misfold of alpha cyanoclein. So, unsoluble, insoluble forms, aggregated forms of alpha cyanoclein. So we have generated a line where alpha cyanoclein was inducible upon uh, DOCS application. And the suggestion is uh, that, um, or the theory is that um, the uh, aggregation of alpha cyanoclein actually is a spreading, um, a, a, a spreading mechanism, like a, a prion-like mechanism, so that if you have one misfolded alpha, alpha cyanoclein molecule, that this can lead to the mis uh, to, mis to the misfolding of other alpha cyanoclein proteins. So we have uh, generated or established in uh, collaboration with Lundbeck, Tina Stummen, and Charlotte Weihoy from Lundbeck a seeding assay where we have used these lines, alpha cyanoclein overexpression lines, uh, for a so called seeding assay. We first generated misfolded alpha cyanoclein aggregates that was done in vitro just by boiling them in a, following a certain protocol. We received these fibrils and then we treated our uh, neurons that we have derived from our alpha cyanoclein overexpressing IPS cells. And then we analyzed them for two uh, characteristics. The first was the phosphorylation of alpha cyanoclein because this is a prerequisite of uh, aggregate formation. So we looked at the phosphorylation pattern or the phosphorylation status of the endogenous or the, uh, um, the this alpha cyanoclein which was expressed in the cells, the phosphorylation status of the endogenous alpha cyanoclein, and then we also looked at the aggregation using a FRED assay. And here are these two graphs. The upper graph is showing the phosphorylation. When we, not add, when we are not adding doxycycline at the left side, you can see there was no phosphorylation of the endogenous alpha cyanoclein, so of the overexpressed alpha cyanoclein. Uh, sorry, not overexpressed because we didn't add dox, of course. Um, but when we added the seeding material, there was no phosphorylation of the endogenous alpha cyanoclein. Only when we, ins when we uh, treated the cells with dox and when alpha cyanoclein was overexpressed, we found that, that alpha cyanoclein became phosphorylated. And in the lower graph, we can actually see the uh, aggregation of alpha cyanoclein, of the endogenous alpha cyanoclein. Again, at the left side, uh, we only added seeding material, but we didn't add docs. And here at the right side, we added docs, but here for the zero, 
uh, we didn't add seeding material and we did not see aggregation of the endogenous alpha cyanophylline. But in a dose dependent manner, by adding the seeding material, the endogenous alpha cyanophylline was actually forming aggregates. So, this was uh, a seeding assay as an example for a, a disease model for Parkinson's disease. And I would like to finish with this uh, figure which is showing the um, aggregated alpha cyanotein in the cells by aminocytochemistry. Um, the cells were stained with MAC2, a neuronal marker, and with an um, antibody detecting phosphorylated alpha cyanotein at position 129. And since the endogenous or the overexpressed alpha cyanotein was expressing, was um, um, coupled to an HA tag, it was traceable with an HA recognizing antibody. And all the yellow dots you can see here is endogenous hyperphosphorylated alpha cyanotein in our cells. And that's the end of my presentation. And now I would like to hand over to my colleague Peter Reinhardt. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. And so just uh... To correct you, so I feel already very old because it has been, I checked it, I think 13 years that we started working on this um, project once together. So yeah, thank you very much for this very kind um, introduction and also for your great presentation. Um, I would like to um, take, take it from here and um, show you an example of how we are enabling um, the use of iPSC-derived cells and in particular iPSC-derived neurons in our daily research routine. So just a very short disclaimer. Um, the, we are employees of EPVI and therefore uh, we all um, receive royalties from EPVI. So ben Benjamin already gave an excellent introduction into um, induced pluripotent stem cells. And this is just a brief recap recapitulation on top um, why we think that IPS cells are such great models. So um, you can make them donor specific. Um, at least theoretically, you can grow as many um, cells of them as you want. Um, if you know why, if you know how, then you can guide them into a specific cell type. They are genetically tractable, as um, Benjamin could nicely um, present to you. And, and if you talk about um, neurons in particular, so for the first time, they really allow you access to functional human cells at scale for in vitro experiments. So um, on the bottom, I want to show you um, that, I mean, of course, um, in our daily routine and also in our daily research, um, we don't always work with iPSC-derived cells. There's, there are many, many good reasons um, to also use, for example, other in vitro models to use immortalized cell lines. Um, if you have a very specific question that these can answer well enough, there is no reason to use a more complex model. But of course, these iPSC-derived neurons at least will have a, a putatively higher disease relevance when you think about neurological diseases. But at the same time, and this is something I want to elaborate a little bit more on, also there is at least a perceived complexity of the method that is definitely increased over using um, traditional cell line based models in vitro. So um, how do we allow um, or how do we facilitate the use of IPSC derived models? Um, so on the one hand, um, and you can see it on the right hand side, so starting from exploratory studies, um, small genetic proof of concept studies, knocking down, knocking out, overexpressing specific genes, targets or modulators of disease mechanisms. Um, also allowing small molecule or genetic screening applications targeted or um, large scale screenings, but also then supporting ongoing projects um, in the screening funnel, compound characterization on a regular basis. Talking here about cycle time assays that are performed on a regular basis, but also even possible applications very far down the line in, for example, development sciences. Um, so, on the one hand, we allow this or we achieve this by growing um, our pool of expertise, but also our pool of experts. So it is not that um, having, having been exposed to IPS cells is such um, 
an exclusive thing anymore. So um, we are, of course, growing our colleagues um, day by day that have experience with IPS cells. But also by organizing and conducting internal meetings, such, an I, such as an IPSC forum, but also um, very important exchanging and writing up very detailed SOPs. And our goal is here to reduce the at least perceived complexity of IPSC derived models to really um, allow fit for purpose application of these models in, um, in our research. And one thing I always like to compare it to is that how can we lower the, um, the activation energy of the scientists really using IPSC derived models in their daily routine and also in their um, research projects to the best possible um, outcome. There is a there are various cell types um, derived from IPS cells, which are established in, in FV neuroscience discovery. Um, so these are shown here on this on this overview slide. And so to generate these cells, we um, either use protocols which are adapted from published protocols, um, but also parts of them are our own developments. Um, and these, um, there are modifications so that they really fit into our schedule timeline and um, also the um, scale that is needed. And for each of these, uh, we make sure that for these routine differentiations and applications, so also how to apply the cells in a specific model, that there are detailed SOPs generated and used and shared. And also one thing that I would like to mention here is that it's very important to keep these SOPs up to date and also to track all the changes that you do based on your, let's say, daily observations or let's say modifications that are um, very important for your specific question. Because it does not help you if you find a lab book later on that says, oh, it was um, differentiation was performed according to that protocol, but you don't know which version of the protocol and um, if there were like um, a lot of changes made afterwards. And to give you an example, so um, I think we can really um, show that this was achieved quite well. So you can see here on this graph, this is just on the example of the IPSC derived cortical neurons as one of the cell types that uh, we regularly um, generate from IPS cells. You have in blue um, the number of cells and here in, in millions um, for, for um that are plated on assay ready plates so that um, scientists can use to directly perform their experiments. But in red, the number of plating ready neurons um, that were generated. And you can see that these are more and that these are um, even increasing more strongly compared to the blue line. And how is this? Um, of course, we are not just plating um, the double or triple amount of cells in the same plate format. Um, also, unfortunately, um, uh, we are not growing our team that dramatically, but this is just that these plating ready cells are being handled by the scientists themselves that need them later in their experiments. And so this is um, just achieved by that these scientists are more trained, so they take over more parts and later parts of the protocols. We simplified and aligned the communication and handover for the assay ready plates. Um, and also we established more efficient procedures um, for generating the cells and also larger cell batches. But it, it is really important to empower the scientists to use and also make partially their own IPSC derived cells so that the IPS cells move out of this, let's say niche of these fancy cells that people are afraid to touch to really um, make them widely applicable and prevent that the supply of cells is simply any, uh, a bottleneck to any project. And this is just to give you a graphical overview over, of, over our cell banking procedure for the ready um, to use IPSC batches. So when these cells come in and we get them, for example, from collaborators um, or they are obtained from um, the cell banks such as EBISC, which is a great resource that Met Benjamin mentioned already, um, they are briefly um, expanded and the very small batches frozen away for long-term backup, but also to distribute it within the organization. These are then used to generate first a master cell bank and this master cell bank typically contains around 50 vials. Part of it, the small part is sent out for external storage in case something happens here to our liquid nitrogen storage. 
And um, then each of these vials is then always used to generate a working cell bank. And the working cell bank is aimed at around 80 up to 100 or more vials. And one of these vials typically contains 10 to 20 million viable cells per vial. Um, after thawing, the viability should be above 90%. And this really helps everybody um, a great deal in the lab because you don't need to maintain a running culture or you don't take care of freezing your own cell batches. And you can imagine, you know, I mean, I remember these days when you had like, I don't know, 20 different passages frozen away and then, you know, had some fiddly handwriting on these vials and then you had the secret um, Excel sheet where it was marked where these are and also that don't use this batch and uh, use this batch and then there is only two vials left and you need more for your experiments. And this is really um, aimed to allow people to just go there take a vial, thaw them up, put them in their experiments, don't need to typically expand them a lot before um, doing your differentiation or your experiments, and then always be able to go back to the same batch to for experiments and have the same expected user experience. So these banks are also then um, qc and some QC parameters, um, of course, are sterility, including mycoplasm testing, um, viability, post-thaw, growth, so how are they expandable, um, but also expression of, expression of pluripotency markers and, of course, also um, checking chirotypical integrity. One thing that is very interesting here is that these cells um, um, we have not found any major chromosomal aberrations even after making these large cell batches so far, but of course you can never be sure, so better be safe than sorry. And now this is then um, the part um, where we get to how to make the, the cells in question that we need for our experiments. And this is just a very beautiful example here of a very detailed and a um, extremely nicely working um, protocol that colleagues from us um, established um, in, in our Cambridge site um, to differentiate cortical neurons out of iPS cells. So this um, is outlined um, above and there is a stage in between where these cells can be frozen away um, and banked as large batches of cortical neural progenitor cells, NPCs, which are then briefly pre-differentiated and then plated into the final assay format um, or the final plates for analysis. And this protocol is not only aimed at the differentiation of dorsal excitatory cortical neurons, um, also shown here by the IF staining above, but um, also that these cells really um, provide cells that are nicely distributed, single cellular distribution and ideal for imaging purposes. For example, um, observing aggregated tau protein. And these can be also maintained for extremely long time. So even months um, after the plating and they stay like you can see it on the bottom right side. Um, so they really are um, staying as these nicely beautiful um, single separated cells, which is very important for long-term cultures. But you can also anticipate, and this is um, something that Benjamin already mentioned before, that this is a lengthy process. You take a long time to get to the um, let's say plating assay ready cells um, and also this is something that not everybody can um, do without having um, at least a decent experience in handling IPS cells. So therefore another protocol that already, already also Benjamin um, had mentioned and shown is that um, the use of these um, INGN2 or inducible neurogenin 2 neurons, the protocol is much shorter. It is outlined in the upper left hand corner so only two days of a pre-differentiation step where these cells are exposed to doxycycline, which then triggers the expression of the pro-neurogenic transcription factor, neurogenin 2. This is enough to um, push them into a pro-neuronal fate, and then um, these cells are either directly replated or more conveniently frozen um, at that stage as a single cell suspension. And of course, you can imagine here that it's much easier to generate large batches of pre-differentiated cells um, that are then ready to be plated just on the assay plates uh, whenever you need them. And these cells um, show the rapid expression of glutamatergic market genes, mature market genes shown by real-time PCR on the bottom, but also shown here by IF staining, but also um, on um, the Western blot um, analysis showing the tau expression as a mature neuronal marker. 
So these models, um, and also shown here um, by um, either the um, calcium imaging um, used as a method, but also by using the multi-electrode array. So we use a, um, typically we use a Maestro Pro um, system here, which is a very convenient tool for somebody like me who is not deeply experienced with doing um, electrophysiology. Um, so analyzing these cultures. And this is a um, very important question we are always asked, like, um, so um, when do these cells become electrophysiologically functional? And of course, there are different measures to it. But if you look, for example, on the right hand side, um, you can see that thanks to the optimized medium compositions and the maturation conditions that we are using, we are able to um, um, show functional neurons by, for example, the number of active electrodes or bursting electrodes um, around three weeks after the final plating. And this is, um, we believe, relatively short um, and also something that we can reproducibly see. And this is very important, um, of course, for downstream applications. And this is also something I want to mention here. These are only neurons, and we can show that we have um, more or less pure neuronal cultures and not really, um, and, and not, for example, co cultures um, with astrocytes that I will briefly touch upon later. So, one um, very nice application and an example of um, how we can use these cells, I want to give here as a um, as an as an example of a targeted screening approach um, that we are applying on a more regular basis. This is um, the clearance of aggregated tau protein as a therapeutic strategy for Alzheimer's disease. Tau protein, which is forming um, upon uh, misfolding and aggregation, the so-called neurofibrillary tangles, is a pathological hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. And so um, the field believes that the appearance and the spread of the aggregated tau um, then correlates with the cognitive decline. And this is something we want to counteract. So uh, one therapeutic strategy that um, 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 we follow is that we want to clear the aggregated tau protein. And so these Neurofibrillary tangles, either in direct or more indirect way, should be targeted towards the um, degradation machinery of the cells. So either, for example, proteosomal degradation or autophagy. And to do that and to follow that up, um, we developed this very simple but very robust essay here. And um, this is shown in this cartoon. So. Um, these iPSC-derived cortical neurons um, are tagged lentivirally with a GFP. Uh, they are um, transduced with a lentivir with a GFP tagged um, tau, um, carrying the aggregation prone, prone P301L mutation. And then, upon the addition of uh, recombinant um, sonicated paratelical filaments (SPHFs) as tau seeds. Um, you can see that um, in a um, round about two weeks incubation time, followed by methanol fixation to remove the soluble tau protein, you can very nicely see and observe and calculate and count these tau aggregates which are formed. And this is um, this is very convenient because no, no immunofluorescent staining is required. And also, as you can see on the graphs on the bottom, this is something that is very well tolerated. So the number of healthy nuclei is typically not affected by this. So you don't see any cell death using these conditions, but you can very nicely correlate the number of tau GFP aggregates per nucleus on the um, amount of the tau SPHFs that are added to this culture. The same system, just replacing the lentiviral delivery of a GFP tagged tau protein, you can replace with this GFP tagged alpha synuclein carrying the A53T mutation. And um, same principle here upon the addition of recombinant alpha synuclein PFFs as seeds. Um, this is then um, um, incubated and within three weeks following the methanol fixation, we can observe these very nice um, aggregates which are being formed also here. This is not affecting the um, viability of the cells directly, but we can see that this is showing this nice concentration dependent formation of the alpha synuclein GFP aggregates. And one way of how to use this, and this is showing you um, the, the optimization that was performed 
the aggregation of these um, as, um, these tau GFP aggregates is um, time dependent. So the longer you wait, and also there is an optimal window um, for the aggregation of this. Um, we tried to optimize this, and um, we found out that at least um, 14 days post the SPHFs um, addition is needed to really um, develop a decent assay window, um, and then to really um, calculate the time of um, adding the aggregates, but also the time needed for the aggregate um, for the tau aggregate formation. Um, this was correlated with each other, and we then developed this um, very convenient and reproducible 28-day protocols on the right lower corner. And this is um, showing to us the best pro um, the best compromise um, for time efficiency, but also aggregate formation with a decent assay window. And the way that this assay was used, and this is showing here, um, data from an ongoing project is, for example, for compound characterization, and then within nine months, um, using just 96 well format, um, 215 plates were performed on a um, regular base. So typically, 16 plates per week to analyze compounds coming from a um, ongoing project and to be characterized before the modifications are made to these compounds in the next rounds. And we also plotted um, the um, Z prime, which is an indication for the FA SA, um, for the SA um, reproducibility or for the robustness of the SA. If you look at the Z prime, um, this is not a um, humongous um, Z prime if you compare it with other cell-based in vitro assays with around 0 0.4, but still this is um, a very decent Z prime for such a complex assay. So we are very happy about that. And we have getting we are getting very good results, especially um, considering that this is a relatively stable Z prime. So this is not uh, moving too much over time. If you see here, these are really independent experiments over a long period of time. And at the same time, um, another example of how such an assay can be used. And now here, um, using a genetic perturbation, using a genetic screen. So this is a targeted genetic knockdown screen. So um, we were able to establish a protocol with very strong, very well tolerated and very persistent gene knockdown using delivery of SI RNA, um, using the tau gene. So shown on the lower right hand graph, the map T as the first treatment condition as a technical positive control, technical positive control, meaning of course, if you knock down tau, uh, including the tau GFP, this is not going to um, aggregate them. And um, we were able to perform um, here the screen of 100 genes of interest, so GOIs, in a 96 well format um, within a given timeline that was very and very tough, but this was a very successful application of this assay. So these um, we performed in total five independent screens using different starting cell types partially and also some minor modifications. And that were performed in this 96 well format. And then just um, from the 20 top genes, and you can see here an example of the top hits of a screening of the round number five. And you can also see that the four wells of the replicates are really lying nicely together and very reproducibly looking. Um, so um, then these were validated in two independent validation screens um, and we were able to then come up with a, our clearly and very robust top hit of um, the genes that in this assay system modulate the um, presence of these tau aggregates most likely by the degradation uh, by the already mentioned mechanisms um, either proteosomal or um, through the autophagy. So yeah, and this is just, uh, let's say, just not, not even an outlook, but this is showing you some further applications. Um, now I was talking about specifically how to really implement more robust models, how to implement um, something that also not so IPSC experienced scientists can implement in their daily routine. But um, we are also working on much more complicated models. So this is an example of our IPSC derived neuron astrocyte microglia co-culture system. We call it the triculture. And um, it is outlined above. So first neurons are plated, then astrocytes are added, and then macrophage precursors, which are then 
further um, maturing into microglia-like cells in this co-culture system. And um, this is not only a very robust 20-day protocol and also allowing longer-term cultures, but also we could show that different donors can be combined. And this is very important because um, like this, you can really mix different um, genotypes of questions from the one cell type and the other, and you can look at interactions, um, how they influence each other. And these also can be combined with tau seeding or aggregation assays in these cells. I mean, of course, you can induce tau aggregation in these neurons and then observe it and draw your conclusions. And I mean, last but not least, of course, as you can see it down there, these um, co-cultures also generate amazing pictures or so something you can directly put up on a um, poster or uh, on the cover of a magazine maybe one time. Yeah, so this is um, bringing me to the end of um, my part of the presentation. And just to quickly sum up, so iPSC-derived um, yeah, cells can be uh, very efficiently used as a disease model in vitro for neurodegenerative diseases. But we have found out the application of these models can be sometimes limited just by the reluctance of, of people to establish a more complicated cellular system. And um, so by, by training, um, writing SOPs, um, and also the logistics and generation by, for example, generation of large cell batches, this can be overcome. And so we really see now these models being really widely applied in many different parts of the projects and also in many different projects themselves. And um, try to give you an example of how specific aspects of neurodegenerative diseases can be robustly modeled in these iPSC-derived neurons. So, for example, the aggregation of tau protein or alpha synuclein, and that these models then can be applied for a genetic um, or a compound characterization um, experiments, but also for larger screening applications, um, which we are also doing. So, I hope uh, we still have some time for some questions and. I'm very hope, happy now to tell you that this is the time for it and opening up the presentation for the Q&A session. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Benjamin and Peter, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question here is for Peter. And this question asks, do you see differences with different IPSC clones or even lines from different donors? Yeah, um, excellent question. Um, this is a very good one because um, yes, there are. Yeah? So, I mean, this is, one of the reasons why I always say that I, um, differentiation protocols are only as good as long as you find out that they are not working. Um, so we have seen it that um, there are certain IPC lines that are reluctant to a specific differentiation process. Um, this is, I mean, also widely described in the literature, but um, yes, if you want to really be sure, you have to try it out. But nevertheless, also with time, you are going to end up with more reproducible protocols, of course. So this is a process that goes, so to say, like this together. But that happens, yes. Great, thank you. Next question here is um, for Benjamin. And this question asks, is it possible to engineer inducible or conditional knockouts so that the gene is functional in the stem cells but can be knocked out in differentiated neurons? Yes, we have done that a few times. However, it's much more complicated than a conventional knockout. So we were using um, the Cree lock system where we have inserted the Cree recombinase into a safe site locus. And we had then uh, inserted lox P sites surrounding a certain exon of our gene of interest. And when we added docs, Cree was expressed and was, lock, uh, was then looping out this exon. This is, however, much more complicated than a normal knockout, but it definitely has worked in the past, yes. Great. Another question for you, Benjamin, is could you please elaborate on the role of having selection marker in order to generate knock-in cell line? 
Um, yes, I've done that as well. So we were using plasmids. However, plasmids always have the risk of random integration and wrong integration. So the strategy was to insert a selection marker in the subsequent exon in the in the subsequent intron. Sorry. So if you want to change, for example, a base in a certain exon, you make sure that the selection marker is located in subsequent in the downstream intron. Um, and then you hope, of course, that the um, selection marker does not interact with the splicing mechanism. Um, so that's, for example, one risk that um, the splicing mechanism doesn't work anymore when you have inserted something into uh, the subsequent intron. Um, we are not using it. Um, the efficiency is high enough to do gene editing without uh, selection markers. Great, thank you. Next question here is for Peter. And this question asks, how do you ensure reproducibility when differentiating IPSCs to reduce variability, for example, batch to batch? Yeah, um, I mean, reproducibility is very important. And I mean, you cannot always guarantee it. But um, very simply said, I mean, on the one hand, of course, try to make your protocols as robust as possible. Um, try to also, um, you know, um, don't prolong your differentiation longer than you would need to see an effect or observe what you want to observe. But at the same time, I think the biggest um, thing you can do from, from our point of view is, is to use large batches. Um, so when you have these pre-differentiated cells, for example, these cortical neural progenitor cells or the pre-differentiated neurons with the NGN2 protocol, um, so we normally aim at batches in the range of billions of cells and then like really more than 100 vials of, of um, a stock of these cells so that you can dedicate these to ongoing projects um, or repetitive experiments. And that normally works well if, if your protocols or SOPs are in place that you can um, expect a reproducible experience here. Great, thank you. Next question is for Peter, and this question asks, what assays and applications would you like to use the triculture model for studying neurodegeneration? Um, yeah, thank you for this one. Um, the triculture model, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's um, something that we are um, very happy about, that, that we can play with it, so to say, um, but playing is not the right thing. So it's... Um, I mean, you can imagine a lot of things. Um, just to give you an example, um, there is um, something that is called um, the disease-associated microglia. So one um, thing that we take is to take these um, microglia under different conditions or um, being as exposed to different neurons or differently, uh, quote unquote, sick neurons, for example, and then really um, and see how this affects their um, possible disease-associated um, phenotype. So very um, superficially, one could call this neuroinflammation, but we have a department <laughs> working on this question and they would slap me uh, on the back of my head if I called it neuroinflammation because it's not as simple as that, yeah. Another question for Peter here. This attendee mentioned, I like the triculture model. How do you manage different media requirements for neurons versus astrocytes versus microglia? Also, do the cells yeah. in triculture de-differentiate? Um, yeah, different media requirements. So one thing that is very clear is you cannot just use any medium. That's a very good one. Um, but um, in the end, um, we just use a um, what we call co-culture medium. So this is um, based on the on a protocol from Sally Cowdy's lab. Um, so which is a great protocol um, for making microglia-like cells. And this is a very basal medium. In the end, it comes down to just leaving everything out. Um, and the cells, also one thing we observe, they really greatly support each other. So these three cell types. And, one of the reasons, and this is a, just one example I want to close this uh, reply with, is that if you use these classical neuronal supplements like B27 or B27+, plus, these will normally come with a lot of corticosteroids. And this is something that microglia clearly will not like. Um, 
And this in there because it was developed originally for primary cultures. Um, do they de differentiate? No, we have not seen it over at least the time that we observed this for, which is at least um, plenty of weeks. Great. Next question is for Benjamin. And um, Peter, feel free to chime in as well if you have anything um, to add here. So this question asks, for disease modeling purposes, would you prefer patient-derived clones with known genetic aberration or rather edit these aberrations into healthy donor clones? Hmm. Difficult question. Uh, I, I've gotten this question a lot in the past. So, of course, um, if you have a patient with a certain mutation or with a risk factor, let's maybe start with the risk factor. A risk factor is normally um, a SNP or a, a base change that doesn't necessarily need to, uh, to lead to the outbreak of the disease. It requires that there are other markers, that there are other genes also, that you have other SNPs um, present in the cells to make it work. So if you now want to insert such a, such a risk factor into a healthy donor, you don't know whether it indeed will have an effect in these cells uh, in combination with um, um, the genetic background that this individual has. Um, so in case of risk factors, I would always prefer a patient line. In terms of monogenetic diseases, where you know, for example, uh, for Alzheimer's disease, there is prison lean, which is a monogenetic uh, this is a, a monogenetic marker or monogenetic gene um, where you know that this mutation leads to the outbreak of the disease, you can insert this one into a healthy donor. And then you can, of course, benefit from um, a healthy donor at a higher age, which who doesn't show any signs for new degeneration. And then by inserting, for example, into an 80 years of eight, eight, 80 years old um, individual a mutation, that's a quite good um, tool to study the mutation. Great. Yeah, so I can just uh, chime in. And I think that what you just said is absolutely correct. Um, I've already mentioned before that your differentiation protocol might sometimes not always work with the same, uh, with different lines. One of the benefits of just starting with a donor you already have and you know well is that you know it's going to work most likely in your differentiation protocol. And on the other hand, also from a company perspective, um, I mean, editing a modification into an existing line already gives you normally, um, I mean, you know the freedom to operate with these cells um, getting access to patient material in the company, having all the donor consent in place that is being used also for profit um, purposes is not always that easy. So of course, also this is um, something to be taken consideration. Great. We're getting so many great questions in from our audience and it looks like we can try to squeeze a few more in here. So we'll go ahead and continue. This next one is for Benjamin and this is um, does have a few parts to it. So this question says, you mentioned that customers typically do not ask for CRISPR off-target analysis, but how do you approach assessing these off-targets? I imagine that this becomes increasingly important once you start introducing multiple edits, accumulation of off-target edits, perhaps. Yeah, it's it, it's indeed surprising. So um, it's very seldom that we are asked about checking for off-target effects. Um, we have done this in the past by sequencing analyses. Um, so we just sequenced um, the most uh, most related sequences. Um, when you are designing a crystal, you are normally told a related sequences. So you're, you're getting a certain gene um, and uh, you're being told that this gene also fits, can be targeted by the CRISPR with only three or two mismatches. Um, we have done that a few times and we've never detected an off-target effect by sequencing. Um, we have not used um, 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 Deep, in a deep sequencing, so we have a whole genome sequencing to cover the whole genome. We only used um, specific sites in the genome that we were uh, suggested by the CRISPR, um, yeah, when we are generating the CRISPR by off-target effects. Um, yes, I hope that covers the question. Great. 
looks like we have time for one more question here. So we'll go ahead and wrap up with this one. And Peter, this one's for you. This question asks, mm -hmm. in the co-culture system, there are many factors and cytokines released from one cell type. Will they interfere with other cells? And also, do they affect differentiation, the differentiation process? Um, yes, um, that's, that's an interesting one. I mean, yes, of course. I mean, these cells will talk to each other. I mean, one of the purposes of doing that um, co-culture system, and when, one very nice example here is the, the microglia cells. So, I mean, these are not added as microglia cells, but they are added as macrophage precursors, so, um, which are primitive uh, uh, monocyte-like cells that are then just by the clues getting from the medium and also getting from the neighboring cells, they are then transforming into this microglia-like and also quite microglia-comparable state. Um, yes, this is clearly going on. Um, they And so that also means that they affect the differentiation process. Um, of course, there is only things um, you can have or specifically manipulate, manipulate that you look for or that you um, know of that is inside. One application of this system is also that in a single um, cell RNA sequencing analysis, for example, we are trying to look here for um, possible crosstalks on a transcriptional um, level. So, for example, one cell type is expressing one cytokine and uh, another neighboring cell type is expressing the corresponding receptor. So we can also then um, try to build these networks. So yes, they will interfere, but of course, to really, let's say, look into the culture, this is something very difficult to achieve um, experimentally. Great. Well, Peter and Benjamin, do you have any final comments for our audience? Not from my side. Um, I just can say thank you for the great questions um, and also for everybody listening. And okay, thank that's you also for like organizing this event. <laughs> great. Yes, also thanks from my side. It was a pleasure giving this presentation, this webinar. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Benjamin and Peter, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Bioneer AS, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand, and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.